When FASA closed up shop in 2001, FanPro continued the franchise on a smaller scale with classic Battletech, while WizKids built a new flagship product, MechWarrior Dark Age, which was a collectible miniatures game based on the WizKids click system. Dark Age also kicked off a totally new storyline, but the video games were still a ways behind. MechWarrior 4 Mercenaries and Mech Assault on the Xbox were both released within a week of each other in 2002. Mech 4 Mercs is the last game set in the classic Battletech era, which was two storylines behind the tabletop game, and Mech Assault is set during the Word of Blake Jihad that preceded the Dark Age. The Jihad and the Dark Age are when Battletech started getting crummy, so Mech 4 Mercs is the last hurrah of the Battletech we knew and loved. Let's just get this out of the way immediately. Mech Warrior 4 Mercenaries is the best mech game ever made. With no hyperbole, this is the grandest, deepest mech game that actually works. I love Mech Warrior 2 Mercenaries with an enduring lust not seen for a thousand years, but the game is fucking broken. I love the added depth like Aerotech Fighters, but that counts for jack shit when the game never lets you use the Aerotech Fighters. A cool game mechanic that only works a handful of times in the entire game is a gimmick, not a mechanic. And if it's supposed to be in the entire game and isn't, that's a bug. You already know I love the classics, and I sunk untold hundreds of hours into MechWarrior 2 Mercenaries, but this game is nearly as good, and it works, which isn't nothing. You can control much larger groups than before, up to two lances. You manage your equipment, payroll, buy and sell chassis on the free market, hire or fire a big list of lance mates, and you have a system of reputation with your two primary employers. The missions are fun, and there is even a complete Solaris Arena campaign to enjoy or ignore at your discretion. Of course, this plethora of epic comes at a price. The game engine still doesn't feel much like MechWarrior. On balance, MechWarrior 3 was the best simulation. It's just a shame there was never any content for it. So while I don't think MechWarrior 4 Vengeance and the Mech 4 Engine have the best moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, Mech 4 Mercenaries more than makes up for it with a deeply layered shell game and large-scale combat tactics. There's also no randomly generated non-tent. The game is big, but all of it is handcrafted. Throughout this video, you'll probably hear me calling the game Mercenaries 4 or Mercs 4, which is just some sort of weird shorthand that I seem to have come up with on my own. Mercs 4 takes place during the Fedcom Civil War, an enormous internal conflict between followers of Katrina Steiner and Victor Davion. Unlike the Clan War, for example, there isn't a shifting front line, but instead planets are locked in a power struggle between the two sides. For the first time since MechWarrior 2 Mercenaries, you're a major player in actual events, instead of some sideshow that the developers had to come up with to avoid being shafted by the IP restrictions. There's a news feed of the background happenings of the Civil War you can read, which is still great world building, but on top of that you're involved directly in every part of the war, which makes the game feel enormous and important. You play as Spectre, a merc commander with a small outfit that gets sponsored by one of the four big mercenary companies. Depending on the merc unit you sign up with, you get different starting bonuses and slightly different rewards throughout the game. Instead of taking contracts from your office on outreach and getting locked into a single campaign like in Mech 2 Mercs, you jump between solar systems to take individual contracts. Each planet you visit has a series of missions, with occasional branching paths or side missions you can take. Almost all of them are in some way related to the ongoing Steiner vs. Davion conflict. So the missions you undertake and your actions affect the disposition of the two major factions. You also gain fame and infamy for heroic or villainous acts. Your fame and your relationship with each faction determines what missions you can get and ultimately which of the game's endings is available to you. As with Vengeance and Black Knight, each mission is very large and has a lot of stuff going on. Your enemies have a great mix of vehicles, mechs, aircraft, and in some missions, so do you. That combined arm stuff is what makes the fighting in the MechWarrior 4 trilogy feel like it's really happening. Mech 4 Mercs has a great variety of missions, although too many of them are convoy protection jobs for my liking. These are all still basically luck of the draw missions that you have to retry over and over again every time a stray flight of LRMs happens to hit some poor schmuck's limo. Aside from that, it's fantastic. There are several really good base defense and base assault missions, and none of them give me combat fatigue like the last two games. Shorter missions with a bit less mech versus mech combat makes mech 4 mercs flow much better and keeps the missions from getting boring. Off the top of my head, I can't think of a single mission from Mech 4 Mercs that drags on too long. The outcome of missions or the optional side missions very frequently has an effect on how the later missions in the campaign play out, which really makes optional objectives feel important for reasons other than an extra payday. For example, bail out a friendly Merc company in one mission and they'll return the favor next time. Thanks for pulling our butts out of the fire, Spectre. Thank the commonality, they're footing the bill. 
full lance of mechs at Gamma. Suggest you seek alternate route. No need for that, Spectre One. Hammerlance is moving to engage. Hammerlance? We caught word on the news you were in a world of hurt. The missions on each planet have a logical progression as the Civil War heats up in the region, and each planet gets a really satisfying conclusion. Also, once the campaign is over, the side missions are closed off to you because the conflict on that planet is already decided for one side or the other. Almost every one of the campaigns is memorable. The early game Eaton campaign starts off with a few easy convoy raids. The first raid is a cakewalk, the second has beefed up security, but nothing you can't handle. If you get bold and try for a third convoy raid, there is no convoy, just a huge pack of enemy mechs waiting to get some payback. If you're still starting out, your only option is to make a break for it, but if you've got the firepower, you can destroy the ambush for a big bonus and early access to some heavy chassis. The campaign includes a great combined arms nighttime raid against an enemy base where your mechs are backed up by a friendly tank column and an epic slugfest to protect a mountain pass from a huge enemy force. The Battle of the Barlow Gap involves three friendly lances versus three plus enemy lances and a group of enemy vehicles and choppers. I've played MechWarrior 4 Mercenaries on a variety of hardware over the last 15 years and I've never seen the engine brick a sweat even on these huge engagements. Even though the clans are largely disgraced at this point in Battletech history, there is still one campaign against some overly aggressive Jade Falcon outliers. This campaign has some great moments, like an assault against a massive Jade Falcon Hrothgar dropship, or getting a flyby from an extremely cool recon pilot while hunting falcons in a cove. Spectre, this is Sky I-1. I have visual on five clan mechs in a cove. At the end, you're given a choice to ambush the Jade Falcon leadership in a night strike, or if you're feeling bold, to challenge them to a trial of possession for the planet of New Exford. If you pick the latter, you have to fight two stars of clan mechs with only your two lances. Which is some bogus ass shit, because a lance is four mechs and a star is five mechs. Spectre even needles the Falcon leader about how dishonorable it is, but she'll have none of it. Two lances against two stars of Jade Falcons? You underestimate us! Do you wish to rebid your position, Star Colonel? Neg, you will suffer for your insolence. If you win, you claim the Falcon Star Colonel as a bondsman, and she becomes a lance mate for the rest of the game. I hereby claim you as my bondsman. You now serve the Kellhounds under my direct command. Sir, I object. You can't be serious. Clamors cannot be trusted. At ease, Lieutenant. She might be a vicious clan marauder, but now she's our vicious clan marauder. Not only is she free, but she's also capable of leading a lance, and she's one of the best pilots in the game. Depending on which side you're favoring in the Civil War, you'll have the opportunity to get your hands on some experimental hardware in a pair of opposing campaigns. If you side with the Steiners, you can help them protect the Defiance Mechworks factory where they're producing the prototype Fafnir assault mech. Your reward includes a factory fresh Fafnir of your own, equipped with a pair of heavy gas rifles. On the Davion side, you do the same, but for prototype Templar mechs. You agree to give weekly performance stats on system integration, and I can have a pair transferred to your command. You game? Are you kidding? Where do I sign? Depending on your faction status and fame level, you can also play the opposite side of each of these campaigns. I'm more of a Davion supporter personally, but the Templar is a piece of shit and the Fafnir kicks ass, so it's a difficult choice. I could yammer on about every campaign, really, but I should keep it to a minimum. The point is, there is next to no shitty content in Mech 4 Mercs, and all the possible permutations of each campaign mean there are like three or four ways to replay the entire game. There are only two minor disappointments. First is that there is no way to fail a primary objective but continue the campaign. That's my favorite part of MechWarrior 2 Mercenaries, that failure on a mission sends you to an alternate version of the next mission, not to a game over screen. You also can't die in Mech 4 Mercs. If you fail a mission for any reason, you just restart. Yeah, you would probably restart if you failed anyway, so it's not a huge deal, but that's still one of the major details in Mech 2 Mercs that makes the game feel so authentic. Another convenience is that you're not locked into one one campaign for the duration. After doing a few missions, you can fly off to another planet to do some of their missions, or if you're running out of money and can't get the job done with what you have, you can fly off to Solaris and grind up some cash by doing solo arena fights. The missions will wait for you to get back. Again, not a big deal at all, just something that Mech 2 Merc's more restrictive campaign mode did a bit better. A nice touch is that you have to balance expenses of deploying your lance versus the payout for each mission. If you skip some of the early missions and come back to them later, you can't turn a profit by dropping two lances of assault mechs to handle a quickie convoy ambush. There's the cost of dropping your mechs based on tonnage, the weekly pay of each lance mate, and the repair and rearm costs. If you're not paying attention, you may come back from a mission to find you've been paid 1.5 million C-bills against an operating cost of 2.3. Ouch. 
There's a pretty significant roster of lance mates to hire and fire like in Mercs 2. They start off with wildly different skill sets, but they gain experience as the game goes on, so you can actually do well to hire a lower skill lance mate early on and train them up over the course of the game. You can wait to get higher skilled lance mates later when you have more money. This includes the lance commanders who are the only ones you can put in charge of your second lance. Some of the lance mates are just ridiculous cartoon characters and all are very broadly drawn, but most of them have interesting little personalities. Roger, target eliminated. I need a new target. <laughs> target destroyed. During missions, your lance will react to events and dialogue from your main character, which weirdly adds another bit of replay value. It's all pretty much randomized, but it's still fun to hear what they have to say. Clanners, didn't we kick their butts already? Lance mates can get injured or killed if their mechs go down, like in Mech 2 Mercs. It really sucks when a lance mate you've fought with since the beginning of the game, and who has more importantly leveled up into a badass, gets waxed in a late game mission. It sucks when it happens, but it's awesome that it can happen. Even setting aside the lance mates, the game still has an excellent interplay between your character Spectre and your mission coordinator Castle. Spectre is a really good character and makes wry observations like those found in the journals of your character in Mech 2 Mercs. There's no telling if the Loyalists have another camouflaged base nearby. Roger. Attack Ops and Salvage en route. ETA, one five minutes. Spectre and Castle occasionally disagree, but always work well together. And there may be something there, but that's none of my business. Solaris mode is a major part of the game, instead of just a short campaign in the original Mercenaries. There are three main arenas, all of which are much larger and more fun to fight in than in Mech 2 Mercs, where the arenas were tiny little grind houses where you basically start the mission under fire from every other competitor. At the start, you can only compete in the light mech circuit, but as you win more matches, you gain access to the heavier weight classes. Once you reach the championships, the weight restrictions are eliminated, so you see a mix of all mech types in one climactic free-for-all melee. Through it all, you get the instantly memorable play-by-play -play provided by Duncan Fisher, a burned-out old mech jockey who likes to tell stories about his life when there's not too much action. This is Duncan Fisher bringing you the play-by-play -play as we prepare for the lightweight series. Boy, do we have a lineup for you today. He also comments on the backstory of other Solaris pilots, all of whom you'll face mixed in with the generic competitors in the Solaris missions. You never can tell when situations like, ouch, that one's gotta hurt. Looks like that's one mech for the trash heap. Duncan Fisher is a fan favorite for obvious reasons and is voiced by George Ledeau, who does something like 18 characters in Mech 4 Mercs alone. He also worked on Black Knight and Majesty, both Cyberlore games. I'll include a link below to his website, which has a bunch of outtakes from the Duncan Fisher sessions. It's fantastic. That's it, that's it. Spectre is now the champion of the Coliseum. From out of nowhere, I haven't seen a performance like this since Gross took the Grand Championship in 62. The sands are choked with debris, and only the best man is left standing. And today, that man is Spectre. At the tail end of your epic mercenary career, there are three possible endings based on your route through the game. If you support a Davion, you depose the Steiners and get pretty close to a canon ending as recognized by the official source material. If you support the Steiners, the plot has to contort a bit to keep things from getting too far away from the source material. Since Katrina Steiner can't actually win, she gets poached by Clan Wolf and Spectre becomes a wolf warrior. The neutral ending is a branch from the Steiner ending, where Spectre and his Merc unit go rogue and capture a base in the Chaos March to use as their own. This one is probably the most satisfying, even though following Davion to the canonical plot conclusion is the cleanest way to wrap up the story. Regardless of which ending you get, there's a little teaser at the end. It was a pretty cushy job until the winds of discontent came blowing in from Terra. Of course, that's another story altogether. Oh shit, it's Word of Blake. MechWarrior 4 Mercenaries came out four days before Mech Assault, so if you somehow finished it really fast, this was a nice teaser to lead into the Jihad plot. What a shame, then, that the whole Word of Blake Jihad plot is bullshit. Even so, I'd rather experience the Jihad through the lens of MechWarrior 4's engine than Mech Assault, if possible, but as Spectre says, that's another story available now for the Microsoft Xbox console. You probably want me to talk about the MechTech Mech Packs, and I will, but first I have to talk about the official Microsoft Mech Packs. If you thought horse armor was stupid, you ain't seen nothing yet. In possibly the earliest and sleaziest example of DLC shenanigans, Microsoft released many expansions in the form of the Innersphere and Clan Mech Packs. These came out three months before MechWarrior 4 Mercenaries and were intended for use with Vengeance. 
Each one contains a meager four mechs, a few useless new weapons, and a map, and it's all multiplayer only. On the surface, that's not so terrible. More multiplayer content for diehard multiplayer mech jocks, Sure, why not? It doesn't hurt anybody. Where it gets real fucking stupid is that all of this content is included in MechWarrior 4 Mercenaries. You might say that doesn't sound very stupid, but that's because you didn't let me finish. Calm thyself. All of the content is included, but it is inaccessible if you don't have the packs. These packs came out very close to the release of Mercenaries, the two Solaris multiplayer maps are reused for the Solaris mode in Mercs, and the mechs are used by enemies in missions. It's like retroactive on-disc DLC. For a while, Mech Tech had the rights to freely distribute MechWarrior 4 Vengeance and Mercenaries, and they bundled it with their ever-expanding Mech Packs of bonus chassis and weapons. Towards the end of its development, the Mech Pack was a gargantuan collection of stuff. Most of the new mechs were a nice addition, including some of the classic unseen designs I talked about many episodes ago. The new weapon selection was a bit too granular for even my normally insatiable appetite, without much utility or appeal unless you're trying to recreate very specific designs or scenarios from the tabletop game. One new feature that's quite clever is the addition of new types of hardpoints. Instead of ballistic, energy, missile, and omni, there are also now direct fire, which is energy or ballistic, ammo consuming, which is ballistic or missile, or heat generating, which is energy or missile. It's a smart concept and helps to further differentiate the now, frankly, ridiculous number of mechs. The Mech Tech Mech Packs also included the bullshit DLC, so finally there's a way for me to get my Warhawk fix. Initially, the added content wasn't available in campaign mode, but they were able to sort of hack it in there eventually. Mostly the focus is on multiplayer, which would be great, except I've never been able to find a Mech Force server that didn't have a retarded rules set. No heat, no ammo matches in glorified deathmatch arena turns the game into the Mech Warrior equivalent of Unreal Tournament's insta-gib mode. Big fucking waste of time. If there were enough players, huge scale multiplayer battles including squads of mech tech's power armor could be very cool. But I doubt anything like that ever happened. I just don't see most multiplayer experiences living up to the possibilities of the gameplay, especially not MechWarrior, and especially, especially not MechWarrior many years after release. The inclusion of infantry especially is just baffling. I'm sort of impressed on a technical level that they even did this, but how in the hell would you go about integrating this into multiplayer? If you want to simulate some infantry combat, play Op Flash. Mech Tech also designed a new radar system that attempts to simulate a difference between long-range scanning and direct line-of-sight radar, which could be very cool in large-scale multiplayer. As I recall, one of the mech packs removed or replaced the main menu track with something else, and there was such a community backlash they put it back in in the next edition. It's just a weird piece of history that was rattling around in my brain. It's a great track, though. I can see why fans complained. Eventually, the rights to freely distribute MechWarrior 4 went away because, surprise, surprise, a new MechWarrior game was actually coming out. And then it was MechWarrior Online. Not worth it. You can still find MechTech's Mech Pack floating around in the depths of the internet, but not from official sources. It's worth checking out if you can get the later version that includes the content in campaign mode. The Mech Tech guys are now working on a different Mech franchise, one that we've talked about before, Heavy Gear which is also what Activision did when they lost the rights to Mech Warrior. I guess it's tradition for Heavy Gear to play second fiddle to Battletech. I'll talk about that whenever or if ever it comes out. So how about the box? Copies of Mercenaries are rare and command a fairly high price compared to contemporaneous small box PC games. The cover has a nice action graphic of a Templar and a longbow fighting in what looks like the Halloran docks level. Flying majestically through the air behind them is the Cougar, so I believe all three cover mechs are new to the game. The Cougar was pretty heavily featured in Mech Assault too, though not as much as that fucking Uziel. Inside the gatefold are more new mechs and blurbs about each available mercenary unit in the game. The blurbs are a bit too technical for box copy, I think. I'd rather see brief descriptors of what the units are actually like. What truly makes a Kellhound a Kellhound? I can tell you right now it's not superior startup equipment and early access to clan technology. Moving on to the back of the box, we get several more classic mech shooting at something off camera screenshots. I find it odd that we rarely see screenshots of cockpit views or mech on mech action. Just these sterile glamour shots. I guess it's easy to get a screenshot of a mech firing randomly off camera, but I always like fancy stage scenes like on latter day Halo box art. It pays to be brutal. Yeah, but it pays the same to be chivalrous in this game, so not much of a moral choice. Engage in four distinct styles of gameplay, depending on your Merc Group sponsor. Well, that's just untrue. Make a killing in Solaris. Fighting dirty can make you filthy rich. Oh god, I live for box copy like that. 
Inside is a nice little manual with perfunctory gameplay information and not much else, and the game on two CDs and a little foldy cardboard guy. The back page of the manual has an advertisement for the MechWarrior Dark Age tabletop game, which I will talk about briefly in a future video. As I've mentioned before, you can find a MechWarrior 4 compilation, which is a bare-bones, stripped-down package including the whole Mech 4 trilogy. But it's not really any easier to find than Mech 4 Mercs is by itself, and since Mercs 4 is a standalone game like Mercs 2 was, you can easily skip Vengeance and Black Knight. If you only play one MechWarrior game, it should be two. If you only play two MechWarrior games, Mech 4 Mercenaries is a close second, just a wafer-thin margin behind the truest classic in the series. It's a totally different game than Mech 2, and that's part of why it's so worthwhile to play. Not to mention it's just a smash hit masterpiece in its own right. The story leaves off here in 2002, with MechWarrior dead and Battletech in stasis. For better or worse, the series to keep Battletech alive in our memory was an Xbox exclusive arcade action game, and I'll talk all about that next time. Thanks for watching. If you thought horse armor, <laughs> shit, fucking horse armor, Jesus. If you thought horse armor was, <laughs> just can't stop thinking about horse armor. God damn it, fucking orc. Jesus, you see her in the game and she's like, oh, we don't have any horses for sale, belch. And then later she sells horse armor. Like why? Was she always meant to sell horse armor and they couldn't finish it in time? Or did she sell horse armor and they cut it out? Or were they like, well, there's a, a horse-related thing that we can just fold into this bullshit DLC, which was like, what, it was like five bucks? Four ninety-nine? Oh, it wasn't even bucks. Because <laughs> this was in the early days, or actually the early and latter days. I don't think it was until very recently where they changed this. But yeah, you couldn't just buy horse armor. No, you had to buy a card full of points at the fucking GameStop, and then you had to redeem it for 800, so it was like 800 Microsoft points was the, was sort of their target for, for shitty DLC packs that don't matter, inconsequential little bullshit. Jesus. I'm getting really <laughs> fucking sidetracked trying to record this, but oh my god, Horse Armor's just the best story. Just the greatest thing. Okay, fuck it. Let's get back to work here. In possibly the earliest and sleaziest example of DL shenanigans... No, that does not work when I say it out loud. Skip it. You might say that doesn't sound very stupid, but that's because you didn't let me finish. Calm thyself. All of the content... <laughs> you didn't let me finish, that's what she said. Okay, it's out of our system. All of the content... <laughs> no, it's not. I was wrong. Jesus. Is there like a laughing gas leak in my office? Most of the additional mechs were a nice addition, really? Jesus Christ. Write better. <laughs>